comes. Y'all are not the only ones that battle depression. Um, and the more you do for the kingdom, y'all that are starting to move into different areas, just realize and know that there are things that are people, there are spirits, there are things that's going to come against you because the enemy yeah. does not want you to do anything. He wants to have you bound. He wants to have you in a state of depression, anxiety, fear, living in your room, not coming out. That's what he desires, to sift us like wheat. He desires to destroy yeah. us, and um, we can't allow that. And that's what this lesson is about, what it is and how to deal with it. So I'm just going to go over some of it. <laughs> I really like those. Now my other one, I didn't wear my other ones that have wings on the ends of them. <laughs> and I have my deal on from Unveiled Ministries today. Shout out to my friend Stephanie Montez, who is the leader of it. Um, we got this when we went to our deal. It says, time to make a change, Unveiled Ministries. And um, I feel like that some of us have battled depression and anxiety and fear for way too long. And it's time to get out of that. And the way you do that is to get into this word here, to know the word. Alyssa called me last night and I, I probably completely, the question that she asked was like, I was probably way off base. But um, like I told her, when you go through things, you gonna help me teach today? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Um, and you don't know that word and you don't have that word in your heart. Not that you can't reach out to other people. Obviously, that's what we're here for as a family and as a sisterhood. That's what we should be here for, for each other. No, you can use that as a mic. Um, but you've got to know that word. You have to research that word. This child is a sniper. Okay. Look, you want me to give you that and let you go right? Because I don't need it. Here. You're going to have right, to get it. Right on the floor. Depression. This is the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary definition of what depression is. A state of feeling sad, dejection, anger, anxiety, and depression. All that goes together. It's because my, my lesson was actually on anger, I mean, uh, depression and uh, anxiety, fear, and I was looking, when I started looking all of that up, it's like, it all meshes together. When you are depressed, you're going to be anxious. You're going to have, there's a spirit of fear that attaches itself to you. So it, it really all goes together, which is when I started researching, it was amazing. It's a mood disorder marked especially by sadness, inactivity, difficulty in thinking and concentration, any of y'all been there? A significant increase or decrease, increase for me in appetite, and time spent sleeping. Does, yeah, does this touch anybody today? Feelings of dejection and hopelessness, and sometimes, sometimes suicidal tendencies. And I know there are people that are not here today um, there's people that had to work, but I've dealt with ladies in this group with suicidal tendencies because that's just part of what they deal with. Anxiety is an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs. You actually, it comes out physically. 
such as tension, sweating, increased pulse rate, because you doubt your own capacity to cope. You feel like you can't do it. Like I just said at the beginning, depression is no respecter of person. It affects all people, man, woman, young, and old. And I think that was, for me, when we started pastoring, uh, I was shocked at the elderly, at the ones that were older that were so depressed. And I don't know why I was. I have no idea. I, maybe I just never dealt with, but it's no respect to a person. It does not matter. And it can be years and years and years, so it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter. And I'm, I'm finding that the younger and younger and younger, I feel, because of social media, uh, we dealt with something Sunday of a little girl crying because someone had texted her something that was really rude and ugly, and she was just falling apart, 10, 11 years old. So a lot, social media has a lot to do with that. It has a lot to do, used to, it was like, I mean, we didn't have none of that growing up. We got outside and played. I'm not saying people didn't hurt my feelings. Of course they did. A friend said things that broke me or if I allowed it to, but it's just not, I don't remember it being as young as it is today. And that is just something we have to pray over as our children, our grandchildren, and what they are facing. Um, the next thing is, how do we deal with depression? We know we all have it. How do we deal with it? And what is very interesting to me, many Bible heroes, many people in the Bible that are considered heroes dealt with depression, such as David, Moses, Job. Job is a good one. Everybody knows Job. And Elijah. And the one I'm going to talk about that we don't hear about a lot is Elijah. We hear about Job and God taking everything away from him and what happened. But I, thought, I, I wanted to, to, to dwell on Elijah today. Put this up here, even with glasses, I'm like. Elijah had a close relationship with God and was used powerfully by him. He encouraged many people. He helped a widow and her son who only had enough food for one more meal. Elijah told the widow that God would provide, and he did. Later, when the son died, Elijah asked God to bring him back to life. And he did. The widow's hope was restored through Elijah being used by God. He did many amazing works by the power of God. But the Bible shows that even great men of God, or women, can get tripped up by the trials and the challenges of living God's way in a world under the sway of Satan. Think about that. We're constantly battling the enemy. Right here. Constantly. Not only was Elijah hated and threatened with death by Queen Jezebel, he also felt his work had been in vain, that everything he had done was for nothing, and that no one else was supporting God. He felt totally alone, vulnerable, and hopeless. Anybody feel that way right now? I know I do. I have. Elijah got overwhelmed and wanted to quit. No one knew Elijah was depressed, but God did. He didn't go around saying, I'm depressed. I'm, I feel it. You know, God knew. He approached Elijah, and Elijah told God that he had been doing his best, but it was all for nothing. This is Bible, and I'll tell you where. Elijah told God he was just tired and he just wanted to quit and die. Not only just quit, but quit and die. God did something surprising. First, he put on a display of power. But immediately afterward, he comforted Elijah by talking with him in a gentle whisper. God also quietly told Elijah that he had more work for him to do and let him know he wasn't alone. God showed Elijah that he was more than just a mighty God of power. He was also a compassionate God that cared. And then Elijah's hope was restored. And if you want to read the whole story, 1 Kings 19. 
this says one through eight, but I was but just read First Kings nineteen. Um, this is where I'm going to be a little transparent. Um, we pastored for four and a half years, and I have battled more things physically. I don't want pity. That's not what this is about. This is about reaching someone that might be in the shoes that I'm walking right now. Um, more things in my physical body and my husband's body and our home and my mother. I have gone in my room and I have not wanted to come out for this church or anyone as much as I love y'all. I love every one of you. God has placed a deep love that I didn't think I was capable of, really. Because I'm not my husband. I'm a different person. And I'm okay with that. I've, I finally started to not compare myself to him because that's a battle I wouldn't win. <laughs> we all know that. We all know Don and his capacity. His compassion for people. But the last couple of years, but especially the last six months, probably, I have been in a, and I'm still there. I've been in a trial. I've been in a valley. I haven't been on the mountaintop. I'm not saying I don't have joy, because you have to learn to have joy through your storms and through that. And you have to learn that God can give you the peace. But I'm just trying to be transparent with y'all and, and help you understand that it doesn't matter who you are. There are times when I've wanted to fly, Stephanie, fly, fly or, or, or flight or fight. I've wanted to fly so far away and see, I used to do that. I've been sober nine years and I haven't talked a lot about my drug addiction and where I was nine years ago. But my friend Dawn knows and my friend Bonnie knows. My mama and my daddy, Stephanie knows where I was. And one day I will tell y'all the whole story. But I have wanted not to go back to that, but I've wanted to, look, I'm just gonna be real. I wanted to go pull a drunk so bad. You know why? Because it would get me out of here. And that's with all of what God's done for me. That's with all that he's used me. And it's like, well, you're a pastor's wife. Who do you think you are? You're not. You're a great pastor's wife, huh? You know, that's the devil telling me that. Because it would get me out of my mind and my head for a while. And I know that, but I know if I ever do this, if I ever go back and pick just that one little thing up, that I will be worse off. Number one, I don't believe I would survive it. I think I would be dead. I would end up because I came close to death so many times in that three year span that I was hardcore, hardcore. I had a mental breakdown. I did not care. I didn't care about the decisions I made. And they're adults, they're grown. But they still suffer because of my bad decisions. And that is a guilt that I have to carry. That's something I've got to carry every day. But I know that if I go back and if I play with it even, if I even think in my mind, and the devil, you, he helps you justify things like, well, Sheba, it's a glass of wine. Come on. And look, if any of y'all do that, I'm not coming against that. I'm not, don't get me wrong. For me, I can't play with that. I cannot go back and pick that up because if I do, in a heartbeat, I'd be finding me a club or a bar. There's one right there. And I wouldn't care because when I get to that point in my mind, that's a scary place for me because I've been there before. And you cannot play with the world. You cannot go back and pick up the things that the devil, that God has delivered you from. That's right. Period. That's right. Alyssa, you can't go there. You can't go there in your mind. When you do, you pick up this Bible. You pick up the word and you get in that word and you research it. Amen. And you speak aloud and say, devil, I rebuke you and every imp that comes with you. 
Stephanie, you don't go back to the place that you were before. The enemy knows how to wrap himself around your mind and to attack you. He knows where you've been. So when you speak the word of God and it comes from you, he hears that. And he flees at the mere mention of the name of Jesus. He has to flee. That's Bible. That's Bible. And I'm trying to give you the tools and teach those that are struggling that you don't have to. You don't have to struggle with that. When that comes your way, you rebuke it. And today, the last time my blood pressure was so high, I felt like I got on the platform. My blood pressure was 185 over 101. And I got up there and I, led, and I sang four songs and led one. And as soon as I went home and put my feet up, it started going down. Now you tell me what that is. I have missed more church in the last two or three years, but especially in the last six months. The last month, the month of July was just horrible. I had a blood transfusion on July the 3rd, my pressure, I've never had high blood pressure. Never had issues, not like that. From pain, yes, but not where you don't know where it's coming from. I went to the doctor yesterday. I was up to 12.1, my hemoglobin, it's back down to 9.8. The enemy's still battling me. But I refused today, if I had to crawl in here on my hands and knees, I was going to be here today. Because I need this. If I don't reach one person in this building on Facebook, I'm talking to Sheila. I need this today. I have a mother that's battling cancer and I watch that every day. I watch her try to hide things from me. And I know she's hurting. And I get frustrated and I say, God, why? I watch you heal people. Why? I don't understand. There's people in this church that you've healed. There's people that are battling cancer addictions right now. And I don't understand, but I know that there's a God that knows and our steps are ordered. Angie Lloyd, God is covering him. No matter what, what man says, God's got him covered. He's got you covered. And if y'all wasn't in this church at this time in your lives, God knows where you would be. Because I know what you battle and how much you hurt seeing someone you love. See, God is allowing me to go through that because I understand what you were feeling. Not my husband, but it's my best friend. It's my mama. So I know, I understand. He's allowed me to go through pain. Because there's people in this church that live with it every day. Every day. So I know that he's allowing me to go through things so I can understand what you're going through. The pain that you're having. It may be a different pain. The pain that Martha suffers with every day. The stomach pain. I understand that. So when they call me and say, Sister Sheila, can you pray with me? Pray over me? I know. <laughs> And it comes from a place of knowing. So we have to understand that depression is real, that we're going to struggle, we're going to battle with it. But this word, getting in this word and in the Bible is what's going to help us make it through. We're not going to do it on our own, people. We are not. We will not make it. I don't know how I made it. Well, actually, I do. I turned to drugs and alcohol and other things. For th over three years in my life. That's the only way I got away from it here. Because in a sober state, I can't do it without God. And I'm not going to ever turn back. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Does it seem like you're doing your best only to have one crisis after another come upon you? Do you feel like the world is crashing in on you? You want to just give up? God's word has plenty to say about discouragement and depression and how to deal with it. How to deal with it. That is the most important thing. You got to know how to deal with it and get through it. You got to know that there's a God that loves you enough to help you get through this. He's given us this word. This is our tools. It's got a lot of things in here. Excuse me. to make a
a note of this, and there's going to be some people that disagree with me. Probably not in this place. But I just went to a conference. Mom and I had, had a BJ. Unveil the Ladies Conference. And they had Bonnie Marshall there, who is who? V A N I Marshall. She's a little bitty. I didn't realize how petite and small she was because I've only seen her at camp and her up on a platform where there's 3,000 women. And she's a certified counselor, got all kinds of degrees behind her name. She's a Christian. And um, they helped me understand some things because 30 years ago, we were sitting at a table with a lady that is connected through friends of ours. And she said, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have gone to a conference and spoke about any of this, about depression and about getting help. That wasn't, you didn't talk about that. And so we've come a long way. But I want to make sure that people understand, if you are dealing with severe depression, please seek the guidance of a trained Christian counselor or a mental health professional, that's okay to do. It's okay. My Facebook friends, it's okay to do that. Because if you, there's a difference between depression and staying down so low that you can't rise and get out of it. So you, there, you might have to seek help. You might have to, and that's okay to do. I have several scriptures and I didn't write them. I just wrote them out. If you want to take them down, the root cause of depression. Proverbs 13 and 12 talks about it. In Proverbs 18 and 14. I'm going to just look it up real quick. I just wrote several down. Obviously, Job 7, 6, and 11. Leave it to Proverbs. Did I say 13 and 12? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. I love Proverbs. This is talking about the root cause of depression. Proverbs 13 and 12 is the first. It's talking about losing hope. Proverbs 18 and 14. If someone wants to look up Job 7 for me, 6 and 11, while I'm looking this up. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity wounded when you're broken. It's hard to bear. We become depressed when we lose hope. When we feel there is no end in sight, we lose hope and thoughts of giving up will surface. Does somebody have Job 7 for me? Six and eleven. My days are swifter than a gleamer's show, and they come to an end without hope. And eleven is, therefore, I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Speak out. Don't keep it in. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, and this is what I'm going to be speaking on once I get done with this. Put on the whole armor. That is so important. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Against rulers, I believe it goes on. 2 Corinthians 2, 7, and 11.
11, I just want to read real quick. I, I had all of my things marked and then they all fell out. Through 7 and 11. Okay, so on the contrary, you ought to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps he might be swallowed up with excessive sorrow. Hmm. 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan wants us to fall. Do y'all know that's his business? That's what he does. Yes, what the Bible says. Steal, kill, and destroy. He wants us to give up. So when we are discouraged, Satan will make sure to broadcast his evil ways and thoughts towards us. He will attack our mind. When I pray for people, you'll see me do this a lot. I am praying over your mind. Because as women... I'm not a man, so I don't know necessarily how men and I, but I do know yin and yang. Men and women deal with things differently. We are emotional creatures. And this right here, our mind is the, the strongest thing to me that can take us out just completely. So you will see me covering you and praying for you. I've done this to myself. <laughs> I pray for myself, and it's okay to do that, by the way. Pray for yourself. That's the first thing you should do every day. Before you pray for anything or anyone else, you, you cover yourself in prayer. You cover yourself. We must guard our thoughts or we will become even more discouraged. Um, but someone find me 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9. Steph? Oh, he's got it. Okay. Polly's getting in a thing. This is talking about the armor of God, which actually I already have a already have a deal started on the belt of truth but I just felt like this was so necessary right now you got us okay. I thought you you looked at me I thought you that's good I like that by the way, I've, already, I've said this before. This is a great bu a Bible. Great study Bible. Great study Bible. Spirit-led woman. I love it because it talks about, it's, it's geared obviously towards women, but it has all kinds of, and I just bought it for myself. I just bought my own. I was like, I want it. Huh? It's the Bible. But what it does, it has commentary before each chapter. It has it, it, all in the middle of chaps, chapters and stuff. It talks about uh, like this one, and you can feel stuff out empowering your children. Um, it has stuck in the rut of religion. I, I mean, there's stuff all throughout it. It's a, an amazing, and I think it was. I don't know what, what Mama no paid for hers. I ordered mine online. I saw it on Instagram and ordered it, and it was like uh, $30, yeah. $40. It's a fairly cheap Bible. But it is a wonderful Bible, and it's geared towards women, which I love. That's that's what I love. First Peter what? First, first Peter 5, 6 through 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's amazing scripture. Y'all need to write that down and read it again and again and again. Let's put on the whole armor of God and I'm going to teach on that. Where is the first place you should go when you are depressed? Where did I tell you? Last the time? word of God. Jesus. And, she, and Melissa, that was a pr private conversation, but it was just, it wasn't necessarily depression. It was just other things. So 
You've got to hide it in your heart. You've got to. It says hide the word of God in your heart. You might not sin against him. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, I believe, says, Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that what it says? I started that writing it. That are labor and that labor and are heavy laden. Yeah. Thank you. You've got to turn to him. Psalm 61, 1 through 4. Y'all can just write these down and read them later because I don't want to hold you. And Isaiah 12 and 2. I wrote this one down. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Our human nature doesn't want us to acknowledge that we need help. That God tells us to go to him when we are discouraged. He will give us peace of mind. He's the only one. There's nothing. This world, everything, the drugs, the alcohol, if you're having sex with 15, whatever your addiction is, it's many. It's many. That's temporary. When you come back down from all of that, it's going to even be worse because you're going to have the guilt behind it. God's the only one going to give you peace. I've got one more thing, and I've got several other deals on this depression. But this is very important. Be around the right kind of people. Surround yourself in your inner circle, if you want to call it, with people who encourage, who uplift you, who don't tear you down, who don't make you feel less than you are. We are all worthy. We're all worthy. God created us. We are uniquely and wonderfully and beautifully made. Each one of us. There's not a one of us in here that are alike. We might have some of the same personalities because I've got my mother's DNA. But we're not alike. God created us in his image, but he created us just uniquely. What a boring world it would be if we were all the same. I love personalities. I love different people. I love people who make me laugh in my circle. And I've learned as a pastor's wife that I have those, but those that want to come and, because in the last four and a half years, I, I've been broken. I've been bent pretty bad because I, number one, didn't have a thick enough skin and I was learning and I'm still learning. It's a journey. We've only pastored four and a half years. You know, we did a cell pastor for 25, but that, that may have prepared us to work with people. But the only manual we get is this word of God. People don't tell you. I don't have anyone really to turn to as a pastor's wife. So I go, I look to things in the Bible. I look to things online, people that I know that, are, that have struggled. But I don't surround myself with people that are going to tear me down. That's right. I'm not going to do it. I can love them. I can pray for them because they are a soul and they need to go to heaven just like I do. We're all trying to get to the same place. But I refuse to surround myself with negative people, with people who don't think that I'm worthy, who want to tear me and rip me to shreds with their words or with their actions. Uh, no. The Bible didn't tell us we have to do that, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to surround myself with good people, with people that love God. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says two are better than one, where two or three are gathered. Make sure the two or three or however many people you have in your little circle, that those are people that are encouragers. And that are going to pray with you and for you and uplift you. Proverbs 27 and 10, and this is my last verse, talks about turning inward. It says, turning inward is not a way to deal with depression. We need to be with friends who can encourage and help us. Please, please make the right choices in who you surround yourself with. You do not need negative people in your life who drain you. 
who tear you down only to elevate their selves. Yeah. Themselves, excuse me. How many people do we know that are stepping on your head to get above you? And unfortunately, there are people like that in the church. And it's sad, and it breaks my heart when I see it, because it's not necessary. We've had one that we've worked with for four years, and she's getting a lot better, a lot better. But I told her in the beginning, baby, you don't have to manipulate. You don't have to do that. We, I love you for who you are. Like my aunt used to say, warts and all. I take all of you. I love you for who you are because none of us are perfect. But she, that's all she knew is how to hustle and how to manipulate and how to, to, to move this piece, to move this, to whatever, to get what she wanted. And it's not necessary. Do not surround yourself with people that step on you to get to where they need, feel like they need to be. And I don't care if they're leaders. God help them if they are in this church. And I hope God quickens their spirit and their heart and their mind. Because we have to be more like him. And that is not Christ-like. And that is not God-like. Surround yourself with Christian friends. I've already said that. Who will encourage and uplift you. We're, we're going to stop there today. I know we have a... Um, that's a good moment. Okay. We've got some prayer requests that I, I don't right. know. Let me answer this person first. Um, we've got a lot of needs. But if, if I... I, I don't didn't want to bring anybody down, but I want you to realize that, that this word here, it is, it's come to mean so much to me in the last four and a half years because sometimes I just take it and I just put it right here. But I have nothing else. I feel like I have nothing else to give. My body has just broken down on me, my blood pressure, but I, I, I literally physically cover myself. Amen. And this word right here, it means so much. It means so much. And when you give out, that's why I try to go to play, and I try to encourage my ladies. In March, I want, want y'all that could be there to be at that ladies' conference. It is amazing, and I want to come together as one. I want us to have a good group. Make plans now. It's not that much to go to the Tioga campgrounds. And you can stay in the dorms, and you know, but I try to feed my spirit as much as I can because when you're giving out and you, Sister Polly, our leaders, Sister Emma, Mama, our people that are in leadership that have led, you understand that when Sister Coordinator, when you are a cell pastor's wife, when you have to give out, you're learning that. And a very important celebrate recovery. That is extremely important because those people are damaged or broken very much so. That's probably one of the most important groups in our, that I feel. The people in cell group, because it's such an intimate thing, they're going to open up to y'all when they're not going to do that in this church, in this setting, just because, and it's very important because you're given out. You're given to them that you feed your spiritual side, and you feed that, and you fill that back up. Sister Rachel Crumb told me one time at Living Way, Sheila, you, now you've, after I got praying, finished praying, she said, you've emptied out. You've emptied all of that negativity, all of that out. Now you've got to fill it up. You're going to fill it up with the world, or are you going to fill it up with God? Right. Two things. I have never forgotten that. And that has been probably 15 years ago. Because it's true. There's been times that I've filled it up with the world and the things of the world. And that didn't get me anywhere. But hopeless and despair, anger, mistrust. And it took me years. It's been nine years. Taking my family. And I, I have a, a son that still deals with that because of me. And um, I know that God is the only way. That he is our only hope and our only salvation. And we have to turn to him in times of need. And in times of despair. Um, what I would like to do, I have this chair here. Mama, have okay. you turned it off? I'm fixing to.